well, don't Milliken remember what would, he said, but I remember the incident. Well, Milliken would have turned the uh, the office of governor over to to uh, Jim Blanchard. That's right. And, and, and after the the election where he defeated Dick Headley, and then uh, and then I, I guess at that time you were a, a law school student down at the University of Michigan, and uh, Jim Blanchard was out at the law school at the University of Minnesota. So uh, yeah, that's right. We were we were at different law schools. We had been at Michigan State together. Uh, but we were at different law schools, but we both had these political internships in 65. And then Jim goes on fairly quickly to be elected to Congress and then ultimately uh, as governor. Now, you said that uh, um, you didn't let law school interfere with your political activities. Or my beer drinking. Yes, that was <laughs> my, my rule, but um, that's true. Uh, did, were there any particular courses in law school that, uh, uh, that you had great interest in? No. <laughs> okay. I took law school classes. I tend to be interested in almost anything. And um, I do remember two things. You have to take criminal law the first year, and I got a C plus. And my professor was Gerald Israel. Gerald Israel was also the executive secretary to the Michigan Law Revision Commission. So about 15 years later, I am named chair of the Law Revision Commission. And Professor Israel is still our executive secretary. And every time we would go to a meeting, if I wanted to do something, Professor Israel, well, you know, Jason Honigman used to do it this way. <laughs> and I always figured he just looked at me as a C plus student and then he didn't take me seriously as, a, as the chairman. And I finally told him, I said, Jerry, I'm the chairman of the commission. Jason Honigman is dead. <laughs> you have to do it. He says, oh, okay. Okay, it was, it was just, I th uh, and I don't think it was because I had a C plus, but I, but I kept believing that. The other thing I remember was constitutional law, which um, that, right about that was when the Connecticut uh, decision came down um, um, saying that a state couldn't ban contraceptives, which of course has been created the, the idea of privacy that has gone on to Roe v. Wade, gay marriage, the elimination of DOMA, this whole idea of privacy uh, came out of that case and that happened when I was in law school and I remember we learned about that case but you could never think through all the consequences of that. Similarly, some of the cases that, you know, that I've seen First Amendment cases, which is my particular interest, political free speech, not re freedom of religion or anything. Um, I've seen 50 years of evolution of uh, those kinds of legal principles. In uh, reading about uh, Bill Clinton in law school at uh, Yale, um, I, I noted that he uh, often took off from, from, from Yale Law School to go run campaigns in Texas and then came back and, and, and wrote final exams. Uh, did it ever get to that point when you were working for Milliken in 66? Yes, that, uh, yeah, it did. Basically, I didn't go to classes and then I came back and took the exams. I remember taking conflicts of law and since I'd never been to the class, I had the exam, and I, all I did was I got the book, and I read it from cover to cover. Now, normally, a case book, you only read the cases that the professor assigns. But since I had no idea what was going to be covered, I had to uh, read the whole case, and the whole book, and I got a B plus. I had another class that wasn't quite as successful, and that was tax, where Professor L. Hart Wright a huge class of a couple hundred students, it seemed like. And I never went, and he disenrolled me without telling me. Of course, I hadn't, wasn't there to know this, so I went up. So after the election, I started, I wanted to go back for the last couple of weeks, and he wouldn't let me uh, take the exam. And I was going to do the same thing, just read the book and take it, which uh, I might well have flunked. And he wouldn't let me take it, so I had to go to law school. Uh, summer school the next year before I could graduate. Good news is I continued with student deferment uh, longer and then was able to get a postdoctoral student deferment and that's how I avoided the draft, which was at the time, 66, 67, was the number one priority of almost every college student. So uh, you had to deal with the, uh, uh, the draft board back in Van Buren County? I did in Pawpaw. Margaret Graby. I'll never forget that woman. She wanted me to die on the 
fields of, of Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam because I was, uh, I was 25 years old and she was drafting 18 year old kids from Papua and we, our family had moved out of Papua. She thought it was unfair. All my brothers and I kept going to college and getting, my younger brother got a PhD and a law degree. My older brother got an MBA. And so I think she felt it was her duty to get us all drafted. So this uh, short period of time that you were a doctoral student and in what field? Education administration. Because it is hard to believe that the dean of education at Michigan State was also the college Republican advisor back then. Uh, now that would never happen today, I assure you. In fact, I just spoke this week to a group of uh, education administration students and where I was introduced as the dark prince, as the primary opponent of the public education system. So um, it's 50 years later, I guess, almost. So that lasted long enough to get you past your right. 26th yeah, birthday? Right, I, had to, I, got, I got to about three months shy of my 26th birthday. And, um, and then I, uh, I, did, I knew they wouldn't have time to nail me by the time I was 26. So uh, you took the bar. And here you are, a, a, a new lawyer. Uh, you, you spent uh, a short period of time uh, working in a private law firm in either what, Weberville or Fowlerville? Fowlerville. I got $40 a week or $50 a week. And then I got promoted to the chief assistant prosecutor for another $50 a week for the purpose of um, electing the prosecutor as a judge. And uh, so I never tried a case. I think I went into court a couple of times, but uh, that was my job, basically. I then shut down the, the lawyer I worked for was also Justice of the Peace. So at the end of the year, 68, they shut down all the JP courts. So I was the chief assistant prosecutor. He was the JP, and we had hundreds and hundreds of files that had to be turned over to the new district, new, court. New district court. So some of the tickets were... Um, half filled out, they weren't, you know, they really couldn't be persuaded. So I created a motion in the interest of the economy and efficiency of government, the prosecutor hereby moves to dismiss this matter. And I put them on the printing machine and we printed out a couple hundred of them and stuck them in the folders and the judge approved them and sent them over to the uh, new district court so they wouldn't have to open up new, uh, new files uh, on that. So in 1968, Richard Nixon gets elected president. Um, he basically appoints uh, George Romney uh, to his cabinet as Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development. And your friend and later law partner, Bill Whitbeck, uh, goes to Washington with, uh, with Governor Romney uh, to work at HUD. And, uh, and he recommends uh, you as a, as a new lawyer uh, to your old boss, uh, the the new governor, uh, Bill Milliken, uh, as far as uh, public policy. That's right. Um, Bill recommended to Jim Kellogg, who was taking over the policy operation, and, um, and, and I was making about 10000 a year, I guess, by that time. And, and uh, he said, ask for fourteen, and I met with the governor, and he said, okay, fourteen sounds good. And, and I was made an uh, administrative assistant for policies and programs. So about five of us. We divide up all 19 departments, and the other guys got all the important departments, and, um, and then it was nine left, and I was the only lawyer on the policy staff. So they gave me nine departments, which turned out to be very much to my advantage, because the cabinet people had to call me before they would go see the governor. And so I was, I've learned my lesson. You have to be in the flow of policy and the flow of paper and everything to really have clout within the governor's office. And so for a couple of years, I, I did. And, um, and I learned an awful lot in those first two years. My secretary was a holdover from the Romney era. So she took me by the hand and around to introduce me to these cabinet officials. And I was quite nervous, you know, I mean, I had never met most of them and I didn't have any idea how you'd deal with them. And I was young and I had longer hair than I state police director thought I should have. And, <laughs> um, so state police was under your was under my, my state police, military affairs, drug abuse. Uh, then I also had secretary of state and, and attorney general. 
Secretary of State was a Democrat, and so we would get letters, people complaining about um, their license plate or whatever, and I had to prepare the responses. So we had a standard response. Dear citizen, thank you for complaining about the Secretary of State. As you know, uh, he is under uh, separate power, and I'm sure he will fix your problem. 